The internet is a vast place. Nearly any question that comes to mind can be answered with a simple keystroke. Any curiosity can be quelled with a simple search term. And yet, when we hit enter and look upon the very answer we sought out to find, many of us experience a very peculiar kind of cognitive dissonance. The answer you sought out is grotesque and disturbing. And yet, you can't look away, and you don't know why. It's almost like coming to grips with our morbid reality is a task fit for no one. Bosnia and Herzegovina is a nation born from the collapse of the Soviet Union, specifically the collapse of the nation of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. On March 3rd, 1992, the nation formally declared its independence, and not only a month later would they be fighting for it. You see, quickly after the country's independence, political leaders that represent two of the three major ethnicities in the nation attempted to carve out some sort of autonomous ethnic enclaves for themselves within the nation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And as a result, on April 6, 1992, the Bosnian War would begin. Full-blown warfare between the Bosniaks, Croats, and Serbs started in late February of 1992. It just wouldn't be until April 6th of that year where things would get actually serious, and what began as an internal conflict would become an international one. Multiple European nations and the United States would intervene in the conflict in order to calm things down. The nation's independence was only just recognized, and a lot still needed to be done in order to fully incorporate Bosnia and Herzegovina into the ECC, or the European Economic Community, and an ethnic civil war would interfere with that process. And this ethnic civil war was something that the entire Western world was trying to snuff out. The casualties of this war were great, and the violence was growing day after day after day. While the conflict did begin with regular citizens committing violence against each other, of course, over time, this would morph into organized military groups. The Army of the Republika Srpska, or the VRS, is on one side, and the Army of the Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina, or the ARBIH, largely composed of Bosniaks and Croats, on the other side. And the tensions and interactions between them were devastating. Most of the fighting was characterized by indiscriminate shelling of cities and towns, ethnic cleansing, and mass SA, which was mainly perpetrated by Serbians. And one theater of war, which we're going to talk about in particular, was the Siege of Sarajevo, an event that absolutely summarizes the type of warfare that was occurring between 1992 and 1996. Sarajevo is the capital of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and the siege lasted between April 5th, 1992 and February 29th, 1996. To put into perspective just how long and vicious this siege was, the occupation, destruction, and general warfare that was occurring in Sarajevo lasted three times longer than the Battle of Stalingrad. Many large killings and massacres would be perpetrated during the siege of Sarajevo. One in particular was called the Markle Massacre. On February 5th, 1994, the army of the Republika Srpska would launch mortar shells into a crowded marketplace killing 68 people and injuring 144 others. And this massacre in particular was only notable because of just how gruesome it was. Not necessarily because of the casualty count, because over the course of this siege, over 13,000 people would be killed. The RIBIH sustained over 6,000 casualties, while the Bosnian Serb military casualties numbered 2,241. The entire city and counties surrounding it were destroyed and massively depopulated. It would take decades and a lot of political will in order for the nation, Bosnia Herzegovina, and its major city, Sarajevo, to properly rebound and heal after this awful event. From 1984 to 1990, the U.S. National Aeronautics and Space Administration would sponsor and administrate a particular program called the Teacher in Space Project. The project was initially put forward and announced by Ronald Reagan in 1984 with the purpose to inspire students, honor teachers, and spur interest in mathematics, science, and space exploration. You see, the project would carry teachers into space as a so-called payload specialist. Their job would be to perform simple experiments in space, among other tasks, in order for them to have a holistic astronaut experience. And for nearly a decade, it was a very popular program. Over 11,000 teachers completed applications to NASA in order to try and become a teacher in space. Each application included a potential lesson that would be taught from space while on the space shuttle. And during its first year, 144 applicants were chosen. And from that group, 10 finalists were picked. 
and in 1985, NASA selected Krista McAfee to be the first teacher in space, with Barbara Morgan as her backup. Krista was a social studies teacher, and she planned to teach two 15-minute lessons from the space shuttle. And that was pretty significant, because the space shuttle orbiter was responsible for assembling the International Space Station, and having the chance to ride such a thing was incredibly significant. You see, the space shuttle program was less than 10 years old at that point, so it was still viewed as a modern marvel at that time. Nothing else was designed like the space shuttle, and because of one of its specific purposes at the time being the assembly of the International Space Station, the mystique and coolness factor of this rocket ship was more than palpable. The space shuttle was completely kitted out with every single piece of modern technology that 1986 NASA had to offer. A new altitude control system, a better pressurized cabin, a better and more optimized propulsion system, more electrical power, updated computer systems, thermal protection, a whole new unique design, and landing gear. And in 1986, Christina McAlfee had the rare opportunity to ride with other astronauts on this wonderful piece of technology. The mission that she would be able to participate in was called STS-51L. The objective of this mission was to launch a satellite into orbit. It was a tracking and data relay system satellite that would sit in geostationary orbit and would facilitate and maintain communications between shuttle missions and Earth. But that was only on the first day, it would focus on the observation of Halley's Comet. It was making its return into the inner solar system on its 76 year orbit around the sun. In order to observe Halley's Comet, another satellite had to be released. It was the Spratlin Halley satellite, and once that was set up, it would collect data and observe the comet as it passed by. All while this was going on, the teacher and space activities would be performed. There would be two live streams planned for the sixth day, one being called the ultimate field trip, and the other would explain what was going on, what were they doing, where they'd been, and why all of these activities were important. This portion of the teacher in space activity would attempt to explain and emphasize the importance of performing experiments in space. After a long time in training and prep, the STS-51L crew was ready to board the space shuttle. And of course, before boarding, they would be debriefed about which space shuttle they would be piloting. It was named the Challenger, and it only been in use for five years up to that point primarily used to conduct orbit research and deploy commercial, military, and scientific payloads. At launch, it consisted of the orbiter, which contained the crew and the payload, the external tank, and the two SRBs, or solid rocket boosters. When it launched, the orbiter was connected to the ET, or external tank. The ET consisted of a larger tank full of liquid hydrogen, and a smaller tank for liquid oxygen. And when mixed, you have incredibly energetic rocket fuel. And once all of the fuel is gone, the ET separates from the orbiter and re-enters the atmosphere, where it would burn, break apart, and pieces would land in the Indian Ocean or Pacific Ocean. The two SRBs, though, provided the majority of the thrust at liftoff. They were connected to the external tank and burned for the first two minutes of flight. The SRBs separated from the orbiter once they had expended their fuel and fell into the Atlantic Ocean under a parachute. Soon after the SRBs returned to Earth, NASA retrieval teams would get the SRBs, clean them, repair them, and then use them for future flights. All necessary components would be replaced, and any components that had features that were redundant would be checked, reviewed, and maybe replaced if necessary. One of those redundant components were the O-rings. They were required to contain the hot, high-pressure gases produced by the burning of the solid propellant that allowed the SRBs to be rated for crewed missions. The two O-rings were configured to create a double bore seat, and the gap between the segments was filled with putty. When the motor was running, this configuration was designed to compress air in the gap against the upper ring, forcing it against its seating surfaces. On the SRB's critical items list, the O-rings were listed as a criticality 1R, which indicated that the O-ring failure could result in the destruction of the vehicle and loss of life, but it was considered a redundant system due to the secondary O-ring. Four, three, two, one and liftoff liftoff of the 25th space shuttle mission and it has cleared the tower seconds before the explosion a go-ahead from mission control in houston challenger go and throttle up and the final words from the spacecraft One minute, 15 seconds, velocity 2,900 feet per second, altitude 9 nautical miles, downrange distance 7 nautical miles.
you're looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. For nearly a decade, there were concerns that were specifically about the O-ring. For the longest time, the O-ring would fracture or fail in certain conditions, very, very cold conditions. And when it would fail, there would be a rapid, uncontrollable release of energy from the SRB. This potential for failure was so significant that for the longest time, many would want the O-ring to not be considered a redundant feature and absolutely would need to be replaced when necessary. Yet on January 28th, 1985, NASA still decided to launch, even though the air temperature that day was record low, 18 degrees Fahrenheit overnight, rising to 22 degrees Fahrenheit in the morning. O-ring erosion was a fear that day. Even the manufacturers of the O-ring were contacted about its likelihood of failing in such cold environments, and they would respond with that it would fail even in warm environments. When consulted, NASA engineers had nothing good to say. They pointed out that they had not enough data to determine that if the O-rings would seal at temperatures colder than 50 degrees Fahrenheit. To remind you, it was 22 degrees Fahrenheit when the space shuttle launched that morning. It was almost inevitable what would happen. Within three seconds of its launch, there was already a noticeable failure. There was gray smoke seen bellowing out of the right SRB. Something had punctured the right SRB, causing it to fail and rapidly decompress. Nearly within a minute of the launch, that gray smoke turned into a plume. It was burning. As a result, the aerodynamics of the rocket were completely thrown off. It began to tumble in the sky and then exploded. The vehicle breakup was around 72 seconds after the launch and all of it occurred on live television. The seven crew members of STS-51L died instantly. Whether it be from the explosion or rapid decompression from the space shuttle being ripped open at high altitude, that is unknown. But before the explosion, many of the crew members attempted to salvage the mission. This was an effort to preserve their lives. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough. Recovery of both the pieces of the space shuttle and fragmented remains of the crew took the entire day. The cleanup took place on February 7th and wouldn't be finished until February 8th. And it would take time for a lot of the information to come out about what happened and how to prevent a tragedy like this from ever happening again. It wouldn't be until April 29th, 1986 that the astronauts' remains would be transferred into an aircraft. From there, their families would claim their bodies and bury them in Arlington National Cemetery. I'm sure we're all familiar with the Sydney Opera House. It began its construction in the late 50s, early 60s, and finished its construction in 1973, October 20th, being opened formally by Queen Elizabeth. And to this day, the Sydney Opera House is widely regarded as one of the world's most famous and distinctive buildings. And it was interesting how the funding for this building was acquired. The New South Wales government initiated numerous opera house lotteries to help raise money with the first prize winning being equivalent to $3.1 million in today's money. And that was won by a man named Brazil Thorne. The ticket was drawn on Wednesday, June 1st of 1960. And at the time, you would just collect your money. And sometimes there would be a cameraman there to take a picture of you so that you could have your story put onto the newspaper. And that's exactly what happened. Brazil Thorne was pictured with his new winnings and one man in particular was incredibly jealous that he didn't win. His name was Estefan Bradley, and he envied Brazil Thorn. He wanted to have that money, so he started devising a plan to get it. It was a simple ransom plan. Estefan Bradley was going to pose as a private investigator with the hopes of gathering as much personal information about the family as possible. One of the major pieces of information being a telephone number. So he looked up Brazil Thorn's address, went to his house, knocked on his door, and then politely asked him to provide him his phone number. And Brazil Thorne, thinking that he was a private investigator, gave him his phone number. And like that, Estefan Bradley had a means of intimidating Brazil Thorne and communicating his demands to him. Estefan, after observing Brazil's family, would mark down the names of his family members and note down their daily routines. You see, Estefan's plan was to kidnap Brazil Thorne's son and then use the number provided to call and request for money. It was a typical ransom plan, and Brazil Thorne was unfortunately oblivious to it. It would be a Thursday morning when Brazil Thorne's son would be kidnapped. His name was Grimay, and on the way to school with his mother's friend, he would be approached by Estefan. This would be after his mother's friend dropped him off at a convenience store to get chips. You see, Grimay would get a snack before entering school. At this point, Estefan approached Grimay and offered him a ride to school. Grimay was convinced and got inside, and he was never seen again. 
After tying up Gramey and putting him under a blue tarp in his car, he would call the Thorne family at 9.40 a.m and made his first demand for 25,000 pounds, specifically saying that if he didn't receive the money, he would feed the child to the sharks. After getting off of the phone, Estefan decided that he needed to move Brazil Thorn's son to a better location where he had more control. Unfortunately though, when he opened up the trunk of his car, Gramey had already died. This is because Estefan had gagged Gramey and then covered him with a blue tarp and then kept him in the trunk of the car for hours. Brazil Thorn's son suffocated to death. This was the worst situation for Estefan, he had lost all of his leverage, but that didn't stop him from trying to extract more money out of the Thorn family. He would call again 12 hours later, asking for even more money, but at this time the phone call had been traced, and all police units were out looking for Estefan. The Thorn family was desperate. With the same news publication that published the news of them winning all of that money, they issued a request of any information that would lead to the arrest of Estefan, and if that were to happen, you would receive a bounty of 25,000 pounds. On top of that, there was a $15,000 bounty on whoever captured and brought Estefan to the police station. At the time, this was the largest manhunt in Australian history. And unfortunately, the manhunt would take a long time. And it wouldn't be until Tuesday, August 16th, when there would be a break in the case. They did find somebody, but it wasn't Estefan. It was Grimay. He was found buried in a shallow grave in a grove. He was covered in lime and mortar and was still wearing his school uniform. The Thorn family was more than devastated. They had lost their son all because somebody was envious that they had won a local lottery and wanted to steal from them. While tragic that they had found their deceased son, quickly the investigation turned. There would be a tip-off. A local mailman noticed that Estefan wasn't at his house and that he may have left the country. And when investigators requested the information about who lived at that house, they were able to show a picture of the man to the Thorn family. And immediately, they recognized the private investigator that they had spoken to over a month prior. From there, the manhunt continued and it was a little bit more focused. They were able to find Estefan in October of that year. He had been hiding with his wife. And strangely enough, he didn't leave the nation. He just found a different place to hide within Sydney. He would then be arrested and sentenced to life in prison, and he would die very soon right after being arrested. You see, while playing tennis in prison, the man had a severe heart attack and died on the tennis court. This is Miamisburg, Ohio. It's a small town in southwest Ohio with around 20,000 people as of the 2020 census. Relatively low crime and pretty low income. And recently, a resident of this small town has become relatively infamous. This is because of a body cam video that was shared online that many people are intrigued by. You see, in the video, the perpetrator admits to his crimes. He shows no resistance. There is no aggression. And the matter-of-factness of what he has to say has left people very unsettled. Hey, how you doing? I'm here, Bobby. Okay. Hey. What's going on? I'm here to uh, turn myself in. Okay, what's going on? I had an accident last night. Okay. I was showing an old friend of mine how to use this gun that she was needing, that she asked for, and it went off and shot her in the chest. Okay. And I've been running around scared. Where is this at? Up on Miami Montgomery County Line Road. Okay. You just want to set your water right there? Sure. You put yourself up there. You got any weapons on you right now? No. Okay. Just put your hands behind your back for me. Okay. I'm just going to detain you right now based off what you're telling me. Right. I understand. You want to talk to me? I'll still talk to you. Okay. Right. Is this person needing assistance or help or? You have two sets of cuffs. I can put two sets on you in a second, okay? Does this person need help right now or are they deceased or what? They're deceased. Does it, anybody it else happened. know about this? No. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I've been waiting. This man is named Brian E. Mason. He was 58 years old, and yes, he shot his best friend. Quickly after they encountered Brian, the Miami County Police Department was dispatched to North Montgomery County, where they found Brian's house, entered his house, where they found Mrs. Elliott on the ground. Brian didn't move her, or flip her over, or administer any sort of first aid. It seemed like Brian just left his house and found the closest police officer to admit his crimes to. Evidence also shows that after he had fatally shot his friend, he decided to grab a blanket and cover Elliot's body in order to hide it. Whether it be to hide his crimes or to hide his shame, 
is unknown. What is known is that he is in jail, and his bail is set at one million dollars. And from there, you would think the story would be over. An accidental shooting, and a man who wanted to go to jail because of it. A man who felt guilty about his crimes. But many believe that that wasn't true. Many believe that his behavior doesn't track with his supposed sentiment for his friend. Why wouldn't he call the police immediately? Why did he go out of his way to hide the body? Why didn't he flip her over and try to administer some sort of first aid? Why was he showing her a firearm in the first place? And why was the firearm loaded? Those questions conflict with his motives, and unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you. But if you want to speculate in the comments down below, let me know. What do you think? Do you think this is an accidental shooting? Or do you think this man murdered his friend and is trying to get a lighter sentence by making it seem like it was an accident? This is a Cigarro cactus. It's one of the many species of giant cactus in the southwest of the United States and can be found in California and Arizona. They grow a lot like trees, with many being well over a century old, and one of their major characteristics is their large stature. When they begin to grow, the Cigarro cactus reaches about 16 feet tall, and then over the course of its lifetime, the cactus might reach 30, 40, or even 50 feet. And like trees, the larger the cactus, the older it is. And also, the more endangered it is. Vandalization of the larger cactuses is very common, and as a result, the plant is a protected species in the United States, where if you were to damage this cactus or damage many of them, you might be looking at a significant fine or jail time. But unfortunately for David Grunman, he chose to break the law and ignore the potential punishments for breaking said law. David decided to mess with some of the Cigarro cacti that were around Maricopa County. He decided to load a 16 gauge shotgun and fire at the 26 to 27 foot Cigarro cactus and shouted, Timber! And yeah, the cactus did begin to fall, just not in the right direction. You see, David had fired from the front, making a giant void in the cactus. From there, the cactus fell forward, broke off, and then fell on top of David, crushing him to death. And it did crush him. You see, that 26-foot arm was filled with water. Not liquid water, but water trapped inside of the cactus cells, making the cactus arm incredibly heavy. It's unknown how long he was suffering under the cactus arm, but he did die out in the desert, and he wouldn't be found until much later. It would take his friend contacting the police about him being missing for people to go out to Maricopa County and find this man trapped under a cactus arm. He died not only from the extreme weight of the cactus arm crushing his body and collapsing his chest, but all of the sharp spines piercing vital spots on his body, like his face and neck. David Grumman was 27 years old, and for the act of shooting a cactus arm and being crushed by it, he was able to appear in his local newspaper in an obituary, with his being the strangest amongst many. On the shores of Lake Maggiore is Stressa, a municipality with 4,600 residents. It's a popular travel destination in Italy, and located there is a very popular aerial tramway, otherwise known as a cable car. The Stressa Alpino cable car was meant to take you from the lake all the way up the hill so that you can get to your house, job, or another tourist spot. Because the town of Stressa is built on an incline, the views from the Stressel cable car are fantastic, and as a result, the cable car itself, even though it is public infrastructure, seen as a tourist spot, it's a fantastic opportunity to take an aerial picture of the entire town, which makes what happened in May of 2021 even more tragic. La cabina numero 3 si avvicina lentamente alla stazione di arrivo Mottarone. Ci sono 15 persone a bordo, in prima fila il piccolo Eitan e il padre, insieme a due donne. Le altre facce non si distinguono. Alle 12, 12 minuti e 20 secondi, orario dell'impianto di registrazione che potrebbe essere impreciso, succede quello che nessuno poteva immaginare. La cabina si impenna, mostrando la pancia. Si è spezzata la fune trainante, la botta è così forte che a quel punto nessuno riesce a rimanere in piedi. Poi la cabina scivola all'indietro, sempre più veloce. Ma la strada per arrivare al pilastro è lunga, sono 100 centinaia di metri. La torre fa da trampolino, il braccio della cabina si stacca, poi il salto nel vuoto. L'impatto a terra non si vede. Avviene... The video you just watched was of the stress of cable car failing. There were 15 people inside of the cable car and only one survived. The other 14 were crushed to death when the cable car slammed into the ground. Simply put, the cable car is old. It was assembled in 1967 and supposedly was checked periodically year after year. But in this case, those periodical checks were not performed and the brakes failed, causing the cable car to slide back onto the cable, slamming into trees, 
and into the ground. The employees who were tasked with checking the cable car for safety and any sort of broken components were all arrested after the tragedy, but would be released. The judge's decision being that two of the three engineers who were supposed to be checking the cable car were not responsible for its brakes failing. One of the engineers, though, was transferred out of prison and given six months house arrest. And once news organizations performed their own investigations into what happened, it turns out that the cable car had an emergency brake for situations just like this. But unfortunately, that emergency brake was found to be disabled. Hello, hello everyone. I hope you enjoyed today's newest installment of the Morbid Reality series. And if you did, let me know in the comments down below and leave a like if you liked the video. And if you're new to my channel, go ahead and subscribe, fam. What you doing watching videos and not subscribing. And if you're old, make sure you that bell so you can get these notifications every time. I really enjoy making these videos. So if you want me to cover particular topics that I haven't already, you know, talked about or you think would be really interesting for this series, let me know in the comments down below. Or you can contact me on the channel Discord, which is linked in the description and in the pinned comment. And as always, I gotta thank the Patreon support that make content like this possible a big thank you to james tucker fisher Tariq, the blurred star mr sandman mike sleepy dragon power lover loving tate tron destroy 23 code connor purvis s16 my golden experience bmx 30 cinnamon sticks scott the fake musician buckethead samantha bellhart admin fanneker bloody hunter keely dunder nas hawk swiss patreon user and noah thank you so much for your support it is greatly appreciated and if you want to help support the channel there's two links in the description one of my merch store and one of my patreon both funds go directly into the channel so we can maintain what's happening here and as always stay zesty